Throughout history, resistance to imperial abuse has inspired millions of people. One of the most important rebels in history was the British Celtic Queen Boudicca. She was the queen of the Iceni tribe in eastern England when it was under Roman occupation. When Roman legions flogged her and brutalised her daughters, they thought they had taught a colonial subject a lesson. But in actual fact, this Celtic warrior queen would be the one teaching lessons, as she devastated the Romans in a mass rebellion they would never forget. This is Knowledge Voyage. But before this video starts, don't forget to hit subscribe and hit the bell so that you can get all of our weekly videos about history. Thank you. Under Julius Caesar, the Romans had conquered France and Belgium. However, the people there told him about the riches across the waves in the island the Romans called Britannia. This persuaded Emperor Claudius to order an invasion of Britain in 43 AD. However, Britain proved to be a disappointment. It was not as rich as he was hoping, and the riches it did possess could easily be obtained elsewhere. It was so bad that Emperor Nero, famous for fiddling whilst Rome burned, even considered withdrawing from Britain altogether. However, the Romans did eventually decide to stay. The Romans often relied on local Celtic chiefs for support, and one of these chiefs was named Prestagus, of the Iceni tribe that occupy what is now eastern England. It is known that his palace was close to the modern city of Thetford. When Prestagus died, Roman official Catus Decianus showed up in the Iceni lands with a military detachment. Decianus explained that the Iceni king had died owing money to Seneca, the famous Roman writer. When this was not paid, Decianus ordered Iceni lands to be seized. It is still not clear what the terms of the loan were or what the penalties were for not paying. Either way, Decianus ordered the land to be seized. The late chief Prestagus had a widow named Boudicca. When Boudicca complained about the seizures, Decianus decided to teach her a lesson. What happened next was considered even by Roman writers to be an outrageous overreaction. Decianus had Boudicca whipped and then forced her to watch her two young daughters being brutalised by Roman troops. The Romans then left the village, confident the Iceni had been humbled. However, they were very wrong. Far from cowering the Britons, the Romans had done nothing but fill Boudicca and her people with an overpowering desire for revenge. So who was Boudicca? Well, we can be sure that isn't actually her name, nor was her name Boudicca, which is based on a spelling error in a medieval account of her life. Boudicca is similar to the Celtic goddess Boudiga, and this suggests Boudicca's task was to pray to that goddess for her tribe, so she was known by that name. British Celts were very superstitious, and believed that curses and other forms of black magic would only work if the full, real name of the target was known to the sorcerer. As a result, Celts often went by different names to their real birth names. As for her appearance, we do know that she was exceptionally tall for a woman. Roman historian Dio states that, In stature she was very tall, and in appearance most terrifying. In the glance of her eye most fierce, and her voice was harsh. A great mass of the tawniest hair fell to her hips. Around her neck was a large golden necklace. Dio also stated that she had levels of intelligence surprising for a woman, a reflection of the fact Romans generally had a lower view of women than the British Celts. Boudicca's army marched against the Roman city of Camulodunum, which is now known as Colchester. Boudicca's forces captured the lightly defended city and burned it to the ground. Not content with this, they then pushed over walls and pulled down Roman temples and other high buildings. Their next target was Londinium, modern London. The city of Londinium was seen as the most important Roman centre in occupied Britain. Perhaps wisely, Decianus, the official who had ordered her flogged and her daughters brutalised, had heard what had happened to Colchester and had fled the country. Boudicca made clear she had no interest in loot. This was purely a revenge mission. After capturing London, Cassius Dio remarks how the Celts mutilated and killed Romans who they found. Some Romans were skewered on tall spikes, and other Roman prisoners were killed as human sacrifices offered in sacred Celtic druid groves, made as offerings to the Celtic British goddess Andraste, the goddess of victory. One thing that sticks out in these accounts is just how different from most rebellions of its time this one was. London was then burned so badly that even today, archaeologists can make out a level of molten clay about 15 feet or 45 metres beneath ground level left over from the looting of Boudicca's era. Boudicca then marched her army against St Albans, and more burnings and massacres followed. By this stage, 70,000 Romans and their Celtic British collaborators were dead. To try and stop her, the young and experienced Roman leader Petulus Cerealis who was a relative of the future Emperor Vespasian, tried to face down Boudicca. However, his attempt was a failure, and he only managed to escape narrowly with his life. The Romans were now desperate. They called for reinforcements from the Second Legion. However, its commander, Ponius Postunus, did not send his forces. He was technically second in command, and the fact that the second in command was the one making decisions suggests something bad may have happened to its usual leader. So what was Boudicca's army like? Celtic troops in Britain were different to Celts in France. In Britain, Celtic troops were lightly dressed, often going bare-chested. They carried spears and most troops were infantry. The elite did ride on cavalry. The British Celts were also amongst the last people in the world to use chariots in war. Boudicca is often shown riding a chariot with scythe blades on the wheels. 
However, there is no mention of this Sarath chariot in her life, and no finds of such a chariot have ever been made. It is highly unlikely such a chariot would have been made or used, as its blades would have been too dangerous to their own troops marching next to it. The British Celts also used large mastiff dogs in battle, about the size of modern St. Bernard's, which were facially more similar to modern bulldogs, and one can imagine how unsettling a bulldog the size of a St. Bernard must have been in battle. Famously, British Celts would paint their faces and bodies with blue world berry juice. This juice also had antiseptic qualities, as well as making the warrior look more unusual and unnerving to an enemy. Roman Britain was now at a crossroads. Boudicca's forces had burned and pillaged many cities and killed huge numbers of Roman settlers and Celtic collaborators. With the Roman forces spread thin, defence fell to Suetonius Paulinus. Paulinus decided to play on the Celts' religious superstitions. He knew that the Celts revered the many sacred groves in central England, so he ordered his troops to burn them and cut them down. He then made sure Boudicca found out about this campaign of religious desecration. This drew her army into central England to try and prevent him destroying more. Paulinus positioned his army facing open ground with a thick forest behind him to prevent being encircled. However, it meant if he lost, they could not retreat at speed. It was now or never. As Boudicca's massive army lined up to face him, Paulinus knew he was the last thing standing between Boudicca and total defeat for the Romans in Britain. As it turned out, the terrain for battle was perfect for the Romans. Using their famous tortoise and wedge formations, they more than made up for their numerical disadvantage. By the end of the day, the Romans had killed as many as 80,000 British Celts for the loss of just 400 Romans. That is a breathtaking 200 to 1 kills to losses ratio. Boudicca knew that if she was taken alive, one thing would happen to her. She would be taken to Rome itself and forced to march through the streets in chains as Romans booed and threw food at her. She would then be fed to the lions in the arena for the amusement of the crowd. Not wanting to go down this way, the proud Celtic queen committed suicide. The Iceni rebellion had been impressive and destructive, but there were consequences for raising your hand against Rome. The Iceni were harshly punished initially, although this did ease off as the Romans realised they needed Britain to be a viable colony for exploitation and taxation. Boudicca's fierceness had spooked Rome, and Britain would become one of the most heavily garrisoned parts of the Roman Empire. This included significant garrisons in cities like Chester, and two long defensive walls in the north at Hadrian's and the Antonine Wall, the latter of which had to be abandoned due to the fierceness of the raiding. With all these troops tied down in Britain guarding against further rebellions, there were less troops available to support further conquests, and this could explain, at least in part, why Rome failed to extend its territory into other parts of Europe like Germany. Roman rule in Britain would continue until 400 AD, when a crumbling Roman Empire abandoned Britain for good. However, Boudicca would become an inspiration for the British people. This was especially true during the Victorian era, when Britain found itself with a powerful and popular queen. Boudicca's memory was invoked and compared to Victoria. The year after Victoria died, a statue of Boudicca was erected in London, close to the British Parliament, and it bore the inscription, Region Caesar never knew, thy posterity shall sway. In other words, Britain, once a province in the Roman Empire, would go on to conquer territories the Romans could never have imagined. And as for Boudicca, her statue still looks over the rulers of the UK, at the heart of the city she burned down in her righteous anger. Thanks for watching everyone, don't forget to like, share and subscribe, thank you.